This is Luca Comai for BIS 101 with the third part of CRISPR biochemistry. In the first and second videos, I described the basic biochemistry of CRISPR. See the biochemistry of CRISPR part 1 and part 2. Here you will learn how the Cas protein, in this case Cas9, can be modified to take advantage of target DNA binding without cutting. The normal equation Cas9 plus guide RNA equal a double-stranded DNA cut in the target, is now changed to a new equation. A modified Cas9 plus guide RNA binds the target DNA and does something else. Normally, guide RNA plus Cas9 results in a double-stranded DNA cut in the target. There are several ways to modify Cas9 and obtain a different outcome. Let's introduce them rapidly. A mutation in one Cas9 nuclease results in single-stranded DNA cut. Mutations in both Cas9 nucleases cause Cas9 to bind the target without cutting. Fusion of Cas9 to GFP will label the target site. Fusion to transcriptional activators will stimulate transcription. Fusion to a transcriptional repressor will repress transcription. Keep in mind that we provide just a few examples and there are many additional uses. Let's consider the Nikase modification. Mutagenesis of one endonuclease site leaves the other one active. Only a single-stranded cut, a Nik, will result. Therefore, we call this enzyme a Nikase. Targeted Nikases are useful, but we will not cover their uses here. If we mutagenize both endonuclease sites, we obtain a dead Cas9, a D-Cas9. The resulting nucleoprotein cannot cut DNA, but it still binds the target site. What is this good for? CRISPR-Cas9 becomes a targeting system that can bring any protein to any locus. In this example, we carry our favorite bear to the target DNA. Looks good in a cartoon, but how do we attach a protein to DCAS9? We fuse the protein of interest to the DCAS9 protein. What is a protein fusion? Consider gene 1 and 2. Each encodes a separate protein. The objective of fusion is to produce a single polypeptide containing both sequences. To do this, we remove the stop codon from the first protein, ligate this first DNA to the DNA encoding the second protein in such a way to form a single open reading frame. See the definition of open reading frame below. The result is that the two original ORFs are joined by a linker's region. After transcription and translation, a fusion polypeptide is formed. In many cases, both original polypeptides fold to form a structure where the two original proteins are tethered by a linker polypeptide. In each version of fusion, a different protein type is used. The outcome depends on what we fuse to DCAS9. For example, a fluorescent protein, a transcriptional repressor, an activator, a reverse transcriptase, cited in the aminase, these different fusions have specialized applications. As an example, we will review the outcome of fusing a transcriptional activator to DCAS9. Assume that we have a gene that is expressed at very low level. We want to increase transcription of this gene, maybe because we want to see what is the result, or maybe because the gene has a valuable function in the organism. We obtain a DCAS9 fused to a transcriptional activator. Where would we find such transcriptional activators? For example, most DNA viruses encode strong transcriptional activators. We then load a guide RNA that is homologous to a region very close to the promoter of the gene. 
when the ribonucleoprotein complex of fused DCAS9 binds to the target, the activator is positioned in an optimal way to stimulate transcription by interacting with RNA polymerase. As a result, the target gene is activated. In summary, you can think of DCAS9 fusions as the Swiss Army knives of molecular biology. We attach a different tool and get a new functionality. There is an important distinction. We usually attach a single item to DCAS9. This is the end of part three.